the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from The Magic Monastery by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. Expectations One of the most eminent sheikhs said, I used always to cause severe disappointment in everyone who came to me to become a disciple. I failed to appear at the appointed lecture times. I was lazy and forgetful. When I had promised to demonstrate an exercise or impart a secret, I usually did not do so at all. Now first examine the effect if I had fulfilled the expectations of the disciple. He would have become so pleased with himself at having been given something that others lacked that this pleasure would have inflated his pride. Only by experiencing disappointment can a person register its effects on himself. Disappointment cannot exist without expectation. No expectation in the Sufi way is accurate. The expected apricot is never as sweet when it reaches the mouth. Personal Wisdom I don't want to be a man, said a snake. If I were a man, who would hoard nuts for me? asked the squirrel. People, said the rat, have such weak teeth that they can hardly do any gnawing. And as for speed, said a donkey, they can't run at all in comparison to me. How can it mean anything? A group of merchants asked a certain disciple, How can this Sufi nonsense mean anything to you? He said, because it means everything to those whom I respect. Economics A man saw his bus going so slowly that he decided to walk home. On the way he met another man, a citizen of the land of fools. Ah, fools, lander, he cried. I am saving a shilling by walking instead of travelling in that bus. You're a wasteful idiot. The fool's lander immediately replied. Why? Having discovered such an important saving as that, you could have walked behind a taxi and saved ten times as much. Two Pilgrims Two pilgrims were talking. The first one said, I have just been to the house of the great Sufi of such and such a place. How did you know how to find it? And how did you know that he was a man of greatness? asked the other. I was reliably informed that all his followers eventually become complete men, that even his anger was a benediction, and that he could rise into the air miraculously, and that his house was marked by a cypress tree in front of it. And, asked the second pilgrim, did you find him to be as had been described? No. What happened? When I reached the house, I saw that the tree had died. So I said to myself, He who does not learn from signs is a fool. Why waste any more effort? And so I started on my travels again. Service How, said a seeker to a well-known Sufi, can one do even the minimum service towards helping the teaching? You have already done it, he said. For to ask how to serve is already a contribution towards service. The Boy and the Wolf I dreamt that I was having a conversation with a wolf. I said, You wolves are famous among us humans, and we have a lot of stories about you. The wolf said, How interesting! What kind of stories? So I told him the fable of the boy who cried wolf. That's funny, said the wolf. 
We haven't got that story. But there is one with the same two main characters. It is called The Wolf Who Cried Boy, but you must have heard it. I'm afraid I haven't, I said, and so the wolf told it. Once upon a time there was a wolf. He got to know a boy who was also a wolf hunter. As soon as he realized the danger of a human who was a hunter, the wolf ran from one pack of his brethren to another, shouting, Boy! Boy! But since the wolves had no idea what a boy was, and had little conception of wolf hunters, they took no notice at all. And some of us say that it is because wolves are so silly, on the whole, that people, even boys sometimes, can hunt them. But surely, I said, if you have a fable like that, it will serve to warn all wolves that there are such dangers, and make them more careful. I can see, said the wolf, that some of you humans are not much more intelligent than the run-of-the-mill wolf. Like us, you seem to imagine that tales will warn and instruct, but you don't notice that the instruction comes, more often than not, through recognition after the event, rather than before it. Besides, wolves, I don't know about people, always consider that fables really refer to others, not to themselves. It was this awful thought which woke me up. But fortunately, the wolf had vanished. Literature Ibn Yusuf said, So many people used to come to see me with books that they had read and wanted interpreted, or books that they had written and wanted opinions about, or books of other sorts, that I was at my wit's end. I went to see a doctor who was also a sage. I said, Give me some remedy for this problem. He gave me yet another book. This one was to show to the book readers. Inside it contained only one phrase, and this is it. Time wasted reading this sentence could be employed more profitably in almost any other manner. Legend of the Nightingale They tell of a man who lived in a country where there were no birds. He travelled to another land, and there he saw and spent time in company with a nightingale. The bird taught him music. I shall go home and tell everyone about this marvel, and how their lives may be enriched, he said. Anyone who has learned our secret, said the nightingale, will have to suffer the incredulity of almost everyone else. He may even have to endure something worse. But the man took no notice. He returned home and said to his fellows, I can make music. But those people had never heard music, and so it sounded harsh and unpleasing to their ears. Stop it, they cried, for this deeply offends our aesthetic sense. They asked him where he had acquired such a loathsome art, so out of keeping with what they knew to be propriety and enjoyment. In a far country. And what is more, I had it from a nightingale, a singing bird. They quickly hanged him, because even if there were nightingales, and everyone knew that all birds were imaginary beings, this music was obviously a nasty thing. But this is, fortunately, a story not about us, but rather from those stupid people of the land of fools. Inner Senses A certain Sufi was asked, Why is it that people have no inner senses? He said, O oh man of high promise, if they had no inner senses, they would not even appear to be people at all. When people lack inner sense, they behave in a completely destructive or totally passive manner. Being aware of an inner sense is another matter. Grain. The chicken had his wish, and was magically transformed into a fox. Then he found that he could not digest grain.
mistakes. A certain Sufi was asked, Why does that dervish over there make so many mistakes? He answered, If he made no mistakes, he would be either worshipped or ignored. He makes mistakes so that people shall ask, Why does he do what he does? But what is the advantage of that? asked the questioner, especially since he does not explain himself. The advantage is that people may see that which is behind him, and not the man himself as they imagine him to be. Mixed Behaviour I was present when a visitor begged leave to ask a question, and Rais y Kabir gave permission for this. The visitor said, What I have heard of you gives me no confidence in you. By behaving in an exaggerated manner, you make people uneasy about you. Even your friends confess that they do not know how to defend you. Whatever your success is, your name will not be remembered if your conduct is as mixed as it is. The Rais said, Dear friend, one purpose of mixed behaviour is for people to notice how easily they are affected by it. A person who is affected by my smile or frown is like a polo ball, struck in any direction by a blow, irrespective of his own character. Exaggerated behaviour, which makes people uneasy, says nothing about the behaviour, but it says everything about the uneasy person. Friends seeking to defend one are serving one's interests when defence is necessary to the defended person. When the act of defending is necessary to the defending friend, then the friend is acting for his own self, not for the person whom he is defending. The visitor said, This has been a lifting of veils for me, and I am grateful, and I beg your forgiveness. But how many people will know these truths, and how few will learn them? Rais i Kabir said, If only one person knows it, the knowledge is still represented among men. And if it is preserved so that it shall be universal in a time beyond ours, is this not itself a thing of great goodness? He recited this passage. A man wading in flooded land with a sack of corn was told, Drop that useless burden and save yourself. He answered, If I lose that which is useless now and will be essential in future, saving myself will be without value. Difficulty One of the Sufi ancients declared, Three kinds of people are the most difficult to teach. Those who are delighted that they have achieved something. Those who, after learning something, are depressed that they did not know it earlier. Those who are so anxious to feel progress that they cease to be sensitive to progress. The Greatest Vanity Abu Halim Fafa said, the greatest vanity is to believe that one is sincere in seeking knowledge, when in reality one is seeking only personal pleasure. But how, asked one of those present, can a person know whether he is a victim of this malady? Fafa said, He is not a victim of this malady if he is content with the attention which the Master gives him, and if he is not agitated if he receives none and if he is not disturbed at the sight of others receiving attention from the Master, and if he values even a word or a sign from the Master at its true worth, as if he were the only recipient of a valuable hidden treasure. Secret Teaching One of the Sufi masters was asked, while your beliefs in school are known, your teachings are secret, given only to those whom you desire, and nobody is allowed to be present as an observer at your meetings, unlike the practices of the philosophers, who allow, indeed welcome, hearers of all kinds. What is the explanation of this? 
He said, Light of my eyes, teaching is like charity. It is to be given secretly for the reason that the public display of charity is bad for the giver, for the receiver and for the observer. Teaching is like a nutrition, and its effects are not visible at the time it is being given. So there is no point in there being an observer except of the fruit of the nutrition. Teaching, again, is not to be considered as separated from the circumstances in which it is given. Therefore, if there are observers, their presence changes the circumstances and also, therefore, the effect of the teaching. If the effect of the presence of an audience were to increase the beneficial effect of teaching, then I and everyone else would have welcomed and demanded such an audience. And fourthly, teaching varies with the Sufi dictum of the necessity for right time, right place, right people. To ask even for information about knowledge is like throwing a lifeless carcass into fresh water. The intention may be good, but the result will be poisonous. The inquirer said, I understand what you say, but I wish to remark that this is not the manner in which ordinary teaching is carried out. The teacher replied, God grant that ordinary teaching may one day be carried out in this manner. When that comes to pass, we shall have no need to see any division between Sufi and other teaching. Working Together Someone asked Ajmal ibn Arif, can you give me an example of things apparently opposed which are really working together? Ajmal said, The person who denounces real Sufis is apparently opposed to them, but he may unwittingly be working with them, for he is attracting undesirables to himself and cannot really prevent valuable people from listening to the real Sufis. But, continued the questioner, is he not sowing doubts in the hearts of good people and prejudicing them against the real Sufis? Doubt, said Ajmal, is sown on doubt already existing. The hearts of good people are not places where the seed of opposition to real Sufis can possibly be sown. A house to which the key is lost they asked a great Sufi, What is the likeness of pursuing the practices given by the ancients in our present situation? The Sufi said, It is as the similitude of being in a house to which the key is lost. A locksmith may have to be called. Or it is as the likeness of eating the root when the fruit and the seed have perished. And it is the likeness of looking at a farm and imagining from ignorance that the road leading to it, and the rubbish dump, and the well, all necessary things, are the operation itself, as if they themselves were a growing and a being. Hali in Converse with an Inquirer Is a man worse than a scorpion? Infinitely. Everyone knows that a scorpion has a sting, but the sting of a man may consist in seemingly fair words. You must know a man well before you know whether his words are stings. How well do you need to know a scorpion? This podcast is copyright 2016, the Idris Shah Foundation.